Okay, good morning to everyone. Um, first of all, um, we would like to thank the PIDS and the CERP um, project team for inviting the CPBRD uh, to this knowledge sharing forum to present the findings of our policy paper. So um, this morning, um, together with Director Pamela Diaz Manalo, uh, we will be presenting the key findings of our policy paper uh, entitled An Evaluation of Syntaxes Implementation and Health Expenditure Earmarking. Um, so for the presentation presentation outline, um, I will first uh, give a, a background on the salient features of the syntax reform and also introduce the monitoring framework, uh, the paper used in the evaluation. And then I'll proceed to discuss the findings on the syntax implementation um, while Director Pamela will discuss the findings on health expenditure earmarking. And then conclusion and policy recommendations moving forward will be, pre will be presented uh, at the end. So what is uh, syntax reform? Um, RA 1351 or the syntax reform law uh, was enacted in 2012 and is the start of the series of major reforms on the excise, focusing on the excise tax as a policy instrument to influence prices and demand of sin products. Um, basically, the law imposed higher taxes and um, simplified the excise tax structure of tobacco and alcohol products. It also includes provisions that earmarks the additional revenues from the law towards health expenditure. So the principal objectives of the reform are to reduce consumption of sin products and also to generate additional revenues for health expenditures of the government. So as you can see in, in this timeline, um, after the 2012 sin tax law, there are three more laws that amended the excise taxation of sin products and its earmarking provisions. So in, in the paper that we did, uh, the tax reform referred to these four laws enacted after 2012. So the salient features of the syntax reform for the tax changes on cigarettes. Um, the, excise, the excise tax structure in cigarettes was simplified by, grad, by gradually simplifying, uh, shifting from a four-tired tax schedule in 2012 to a two-tired schedule beginning 2013, and then to a single tax structure by 2017. So as shown in, uh, in this chart, um, in 2012, the tax rates ranged from 2.72 to 28.30 pesos per cigarette pack. Um, the rates are uh, depends on the net retail price of the cigarette brand. And then by 2017, uh, a single tax rate of 30 pesos per pack is levied regardless of the retail price. So we can also see that higher taxes are imposed every year since 2013 um, with um, RA 10963 or the train law and the two recent laws um, in 2020 further adjusting the, the tax rates upwards. And then um, there's also provision of um, increasing the tax rates by 5% um, beginning 2024 to keep up with inflation. For the earmarking provisions um, presented in this, slides, in this slide are the provisions on earmarking of syntax revenues under several syntax laws. So basically, basically, the earmarking of revenues is divided into two. So first one is the allocations toward um, tobacco producing LGUs. Um, so the percentage of revenues earmarked depends on the type of um, tobacco produced in the LGU. So that's either Virginia, uh, Burley, or native tobacco. So the fund is used for programs that will support tobacco farmers um, who will be affected by the expected fall in tobacco demand due to the increasing taxes. And then the second portion of the allocation is on for uh, is on health expenditures. So sorry. So under um, RA ten three five one, after deducting the allocations to LGUs, the remaining incremental revenue is allocated to health budgets of the field health and the DOH. So that is eighty percent to the national health insurance program and attainment of the MDGs, and then 20% to the various health programs of the DOH. And then the two recent laws um, just changed the formula of, the, of computing the allocations. And also, as we can see here, um, started to earmark revenues from excise taxes on e-cigarettes and uh, know, excise taxes on sugar sweetened beverages.
Um, um, so we use the World Bank syntax monitoring framework in the paper. Um, this is developed in 2016 uh, when the bank assessed the implementation of the 2012 syntax laws. So basically, the framework is used to monitor the impact of the increase in tax rates on a number of health, revenue, and good governance indicators. So for the tax implementation, um, we'll, uh, I will discuss the impact on retail prices, tax revenues, consumption, and revenue leakage. And then Director Pam later on will discuss the following indicators on expenditure implementation. So for the indicator on retail prices, as we can see, um, the tax rate increases under each of the tax laws have resulted to a significant jump in retail prices of cigarettes, um, therefore making them uh, less affordable over time. Um, on the average, the price of pack of cigarettes increased from 28 pesos to 98 pesos in 2021, which is uh, about four times the 2012 baseline price. So one key indicator to highlight is the floor price of cigarettes. So from a health standpoint, floor prices are crucial given the reduction of consumption um, will most likely happen to price sensitive consumers who tend to buy uh, cheapest who tend to buy the cheapest brands. So as we can see here, the transition to a single tax rate in 2017 helped raise the floor price as cheap and premium brands are taxed similarly regardless of the net retail price. So the floor price increased from 10 pesos to 73 pesos during the period. Um, the same tax reform also addressed the low tax share of um, retail price. So the tax share um, increased from a low 29% in 2012 to 74% in 2014. So for reference, um, the WHO recommends that the tax share to get the 70% of the retail price of cigarettes. And then the, uh, another indicator is the retail prices relative to the international prices. So the cost of cigarettes in the Philippines is still considered cheap um, relative to international prices. But um, given that there are already scheduled tax increases annually, uh, the country's ranking can further improve moving forward. So right now, 100 pesos per pack ang, ang, ang cigarettes in the Philippines. In terms of tax revenues, um, since tax revenues improved significantly um, from an average of 53 billion in 2010 to 2012, it almost doubled in 2013 at 105 billion and posted um, continuous growth rates uh, before reaching 261 billion in 2021. The same tax effort also improved to 1.4% of GDP in 2021 from only 0.5% uh, during the present during the pre-SIN tax reform. Um, SIN tax revenue still managed to grow year on year in 2020. So as, as you can see in the graph, um, it increased to 1% uh, 1 in 2020. Um, this, this is despite the, despite the, cost, uh, the impact of the pandemic. Uh, on the other hand, uh, most, most types of BR taxes declined during the year. So the additional taxes from SIN tax reform um, is crucial given it's earmarked annually to health expenditure, um, especially in the context of the country's um, tight fiscal space and the uh, ongoing pandemic. So this is a very important question uh, to answer. Why are SIN taxes effective in generating generating revenues? So a good combination of the uh, combination of good tax design. Uh, meaning there are yearly tax adjustments and a uh, simple single excise tax structure plus the consumer response to the increase in cigarettes makes sin taxes a good source of revenues. So we can measure this consumer response by estimating the price elasticity of demand. The CPBRD estimates price elasticity of cigarette demand to be inelastic at negative uh, 0.83. So this means a 10% increase in price or tax will only result in an 8.3% percent decrease in cigarette removals. So uh, uh, the charts on the right uh, shows the data on removals and excise tax collection. So while cigarette removals are declining, excise tax revenues continue to trend upwards. Um, this means that excise, the increase in taxes is growing at a faster rate uh, relative to the reduction in consumption. Um, we also, the paper also, um, projected the 
the cigarette removals beginning 2022 to 2024. So um, based on the estimates, given that um, cigarette demand is inelastic, syntax revenues will remain to be a stable source of um, government revenue in the medium term. Um, as the tax increases will more than offset the decrease in the removals. Um, in terms of the indicator in cons of consumption, um, based on the survey data, smoking prevalence among adults declined over the years since the STL in 2013. How, uh, however, um, the latest survey to monitor the impact of the STL um, gives a different um, conclusion. So I just I'll highlight the point. Smoking prevalence worsened from 24% to 28%. There are more daily smokers relative to, the, to previous years. And then 6 out of 10 smokers developed their smoking habit in their early teenage years. And then only 56% of smokers are aware of the STL. So clearly there are um, still room for improvement in terms of reducing consumption. Um, um, for the indicator on reven revenue leakage, um, the increase in smoking prevalence plus the decrease in tax paid removals is a sign that a portion of cigarette consumption is from illicit trade. Estimates show that share of illicit cigarettes consumption ranges from 8% to 23% of total consumption. And then based on DOC reports, the estimated value of seized smuggled tobacco products averaged 3.4 billion from 2019 to 2021. The paper also estimated the the government is losing an average of 21 billion in excise taxes per year um, during the period 2016 to 2019. As so that's for the uh, evaluation of the tax implementation, I would like to turn over to Lecter Pamela for the expenditure earmarking. Thank you. Thank you, Edre. Um, I'm going to present our initial findings on the implementation of expenditure earmarking of syntax revenues. And we are basically looking at three things, earmark spending to tobacco producing LGUs, earmark spending for health, and the expansion of the health insurance coverage. So first, on earmark spending to tobacco growing LGUs, we look at the allocation and utilization of LGU shares. So the graph shows that the amounts accruing to LGUs from excise taxes on tobacco grew from about 6 billion in 2012 to about 25 billion in 2019. And about 84% of that goes to Virginia tobacco growing LGUs. That would be the blue bar in the graph. The remaining 16% is shared among provinces producing burley and native uh, tobacco. While we have accounted for the allocation of the LGU shares, reports on the actual releases from the DBM central office have not been very clear to allow us to determine the levels of unreleased shares on annual basis. So what we did also was to check on the compliance of LGUs on their postings of the our quarterly reports in terms of the utilization of funds and status of projects and accomplishments or what they call the RFUSPA. They're required to post these reports in their respective websites. And we found that there were only three out of the 20 provinces that posted these reports. And there were missing information in terms of finan either in financial data or uh, physical accomplishment. So in the absence of a regular audit and a systematized MNE and the utilization of LGU shares, we looked into the special audit reports of the commission and audit on nine municipalities in the province of Isabela. We feel that the issues that the and findings of the COA indicates uh, the issues that need to be addressed to improve the overall implementation and oversight of the earmark funds. So just briefly, what we noted among the audit findings relate to one, unqualified beneficiaries and double claims, and this is the most predominant uh, audit finding. Second, procurement-related irregularities like the issues and eligibility of uh, contractors for infrastructure projects. Third, issues in project selection and implementation, such as the use of funds for ineligible projects or those not specified in the annual investment program. There were also findings as to realignment of funds for other projects uh, that were not 
uh, initially submitted to the DBM and issues of quality or non-implementation are delayed. There were also findings on financial irregularities or questionable disbursements and the lack of monitoring and evaluation. Next, uh, we look at earmark spending for health. Here we tried to look into the contribution of the syntax in incremental revenue or STEER. The contribution of STEER to the health budget, identify the health programs benefiting from STEER and also the budget utilization of selected programs funded by STEER. So the graph shows that SIN tax revenues for health has significantly increased the annual budget for DOH, OSEC, and PhilHealth. In the graph, you see the red bar that represents the SIN tax earmark for health. So from 34 billion or 39% in 2014, Earmark revenues from SIN taxes account for 94 billion or 54% of the combined budget of DOH, OSEC, and PhilHealth. Out of the total steer for health, it was mentioned earlier that 80% goes to NHIP, the attainment of MDGs and health awareness programs, and 20% is intended for medical assistance to indigents and the health enhancement facilities uh, program of the DOH. Next slide, Edre. So from the 80%, we found that the biggest chunk uh, of the STEER for health supports the NHIP for the enrollment in field health. And this is really the intention to increase uh, coverage under field health. So we found steady increase in allocation to, field, to the NHIP from 23 billion in 2014 to 59 billion in 2020, or an average share of 63% of total steer. The approved budget for the NHIP per the GAA consistently grew also from 2014 to uh, 2020. And during that period, steer contributed between 64% and 82% of the approved budget level of the NHIP. We also found increasing importance placed on the attainment of MDGs, and it accounted for an average of 9% of total STEER. And contribution of STEER grew as approved budget for MDGs increased. So we noted the highest contribution of STEER to MDGs, to the budget for MDGs at 62% in 2017. Meanwhile, from the 20%, the um, Health Facilities Enhancement Program, or HFEP, next slide, Edre, as is a financial assistance under the Health Enhancement Facilities Program starting 2018 is the main vehicle through which NG provides assistance to healthcare facilities for infrastructure improvement or equipment upgrade. So what we found is that the contribution of syntax incremental revenues grows as total approved budget for HFEP declines. So that means more dependence on the um, syntax revenues in terms of uh, funding for HFEP. So in 2018, for example, the HFEP budget was at 30.3 billion, of which 27.3% is attributed to uh, STEER. In 2020, the HFEP budget was 8.4 billion, of which 93.5% is from syntax incremental revenues. Medical assistance to indigents or the MAP is fully funded by STEER, and on average, it accounts for about 9% of total STEER. So nominally, it has also been growing and it peaked to about 10.5 billion in 2020. Next slide. So we see actually also growing contribution of the syntax revenues to budgets of other health programs, although relatively smaller compared to the uh, previous programs that I just discussed. And these are the health awareness programs, service delivery networks, and health sector research development. So next slide, we'd like to uh, present to you uh, our findings of the budget utilization of select programs funded by uh, syntax incremental revenues. So we found that um, there have been declining uh, obligation and disbursement rates for 
uh, some programs. So, for example, the MAP or the medical assistance, it posts a declining obligation rate and disbursement rate. The HFEP obligation rate ranged between 75% and 94%, but uh, notably the disbursement rates were dismally low, especially in 2019, which was only at 12.7%. In terms of preventive health programs for the attainment of MDGs, we also saw declining obligation rate. So, for example, the National Immunization Program posted an obligation rate of 98.2 in 2018 and 43.8% in 2020. And disbursement rate was also low, even in 2020, at 28.4%. Uh, okay, so, next slide. Okay, so this is just a summary table of, of the disbursements and obligation rates. Let me proceed to um, discuss our findings on the physical accomplishments based on key performance indicators of some uh, health programs. So we found out that uh, we have unmet targets in terms of in some programs example for the national health national immunization program the target is to have 95% fully immunized children but DOH reported only 47.5% in 2018 and less than 70% in 2019 and 2020 for reasons like low vaccine confidence or procurement and logistic issues even fear of covid-19 exposure and limited limited staff we also have unmet targets in in prevention and control of HIV because of some treatment hubs that were closed during lockdown and the mobility and mobility concerns among HIV service providers during the pandemic. Also, we have unmet targets in terms of um, centers for health development and and pharmacies in public health facilities making sure that there are no stock outs of centrally procured major health commodities. However, we met targets for number of provinces that are free of filariasis, rabies, and malaria, except for the latter two in 2020. Okay. Next, we also met our uh, target for HRH, or Human Resource for Health Deployment we met the target of 17 HRH per 10,000 population in 2018 and 2019, but missed the target in 2020. And in terms of HFEP, the target is that all HFEP funded projects must be started using current year's appropriations and the OH missed the yearly targets, although it had marked improvement in 2020. And some of the reasons being uh, are related to implementation readiness, like lot issues, uh, peace and order situation or even limited operations of contractors during because of community quarantine uh, measures. Next, we will we look at the expansion of universal health coverage. Here we look at the impact of uh, syntax incremental revenues as to uh, whether it has improved access to healthcare services. So the graph shows the spike in enrollment in 2014, following the increase in health budget due to STEER. Indirect contributors, that would be the red, the red bar. Indirect contributors would be the subsidized sector among PhilHealth members. So the membership among indirect contributors increased by 60% in 2014, particularly because of increased enrollment among indigents. And in 2015, the enrollment growth can be attributed to the mandatory coverage of senior citizens. Higher enrollment among direct contributors, that would include us, those in the employed sector or self-earning individuals, as represented by the blue bar. Increase in membership due to enrollments of OFWs, of additional self-earning and employed uh, and members from the employed sector. Enrollment rate in 2021 is recorded at 
if you look at a closer look at the enrollment among indirect contributors or the subsidized sector, we see that enrollment is still highest among indigents, even if it accounts for the overall decline in membership of indirect contributors. So PhilHealth membership among senior citizens increased, as you see the orange bar, while that of the indigents and those under the sponsored program in blue and red, red bars declined. So as of 2021, the membership share shows that 65% is our indigents, about 30% are senior citizens, and the remaining four are under the sponsored program. Next slide. Another indicator that we use to evaluate improvement in access or use of health services is to look at the benefit paid uh, the benefit claims that were paid by membership group. As you will see in the graph, the direct contributors accounted for 75% of total paid claims in 2012 to 2014. That would be the blue, red, up to the black bars. That would be the direct contributors. However, we, we saw a shift in the distribution of paid claims in 2015 in favor of indirect contributors now having an average share of 45 to 53% in 2015 to 2021. The field health also reports on support value. And it um, reported a support value of 66% in 2019. That means that for every 100 pesos cost of hospital confinement, field health covers about 66%. Uh, Next slide. Oh, okay. So we saw that uh, after going through the health budget and the performance accomplishment of uh, the DOH and field health, we saw that health indicators and budget utilization were actually affected during the pandemic in 2020. And we need to work towards achieving our health targets and likewise improve on the utilization of the funds that we are uh, budgeting for health. So we have identified some recommendations. One, we need to support deployment of HRH to areas with low HRH population ratio and to geographically isolated areas and financially constrained LGUs. Second, we need to strengthen the capacities of public health facilities to improve the general quality of services that are often availed by poorer households. Lower levels of healthcare must be adequately provided in primary and secondary hospitals without overburdening the tertiary level hospitals. Also, the implementation of HFEP must be reviewed in terms of the equity and efficiency aspects of the program. There's also a need to build the capacities in areas of procurement, project monitoring and evaluation, and new normal interventions. Ill health needs to also conduct regular review and update of case rates to effectively reduce out-of-pocket expenses. So the, the DOH, meanwhile, needs to strengthen the design and implementation of health awareness programs on preventive care. In, we need to also improve the IT infrastructure of field health for more efficient membership database and speedy processing of hospital claims. Registration to field health must also be intensified, as well as the assistance in the on-site registration, availment, and processing of claims. And we need to create greater awareness, especially among poor and non and near poor, as to entitlements and benefits. The monitoring and evaluation of earmark revenues for tobacco producing LGUs needs to be strengthened by setting up a mechanism for easy monitoring of fund releases and timely disclosures on utilization and program implementation. Edre will give a quick rundown on the recommendations and the revenue side. Thank you. Um, thank you, Director Pam. So for the um, implementation of the tax uh, of the SIN taxes, uh, it will provide some conclusion and recommendations. So the SIN tax reform provided a stable source of revenues over the review period, especially during the pandemic. Uh, when fiscal resources tighten. Um, as mentioned, good tax design and inelastic cigarette demand will provide sustainability of tax revenues over the medium term. Um, having um, stable revenues from sin taxes 
moving forward is critical in the context of the fiscal consolidation plan of the government, um, where a new or higher taxes may be imposed to narrow the country's fiscal deficit. Um, secondly, tax administration should be strengthened to maximize the revenue potential of syntaxes. So here are some of the recommendations. Implement a tighter tax track and trace system involving reinforced collaboration between BAR, BOC, and TA. Um, they should have a common database that are shared to monitor the flow, com flow of commodity. Strengthen and continuously update the security features of tax stamps to prevent counterfeiting. And then the government should also resolve illicit tobacco cases quickly. Aggressive enforcement of heavier penalties under RAs 11346 and 11467 can deter further illicit activities. Um, lastly, um, active, actively pursue international cooperation through the sharing of import export documents to reduce illicit tobacco flows. Um, another example of um, international cooperation is the potential accession of the country to the pro protocol to eliminate illicit trade in tobacco products under the WHO. And then in terms of reducing the consumption, which is one of the core um, objectives of the syntax reform, um, government should increase effort to raise awareness about the health objectives of the syntax laws, conduct regular educational campaign, campaigns on the harmful effects of cigarettes and alcohol use in school, and barangay settings to target both schooling teenagers and out of school youth. And then monitor the results of the 2021 Global Adult Tobacco Survey or GATS to be released by mid-2020. So this will build upon the findings of the last national survey, um, especially with regard to the impact of the recent tax increases beginning 2020, pursuant to RAs 11346 and 11467. Um, lastly, conduct an annual review of the monitoring framework, which the paper used and take early action on data gaps or concerns about the STL's implementation on both the tax and expenditure side. Um, so that ends our presentation. Thank you very much for releasing it.